may be seated. In the foothills of sorrow, looking up from the valley of fear, you can see doubt off in the distance, and you're about to lose heart right here. But don't ever give in, don't ever give up. God is with you, and you'll overcome. Mountain will tell you that you can't make it over. It will try to convince you that it's way too high. Though you feel defeated, know that God keeps his promise. So you tell the mountain just how. try to remember all the trials he's brought you through and when his power gave you strength for the journey the very hour you needed it too so don't be discouraged cause time after time God's never failed you go out and climb the mountain you can't make it over. It will try to convince you that it's way too high. Though you feel defeated, know that God keeps his promise. So you tell the mountain just how big your God You're welcome. <laughs> Once you found Obadiah, I'll tell you, what, I'll just let you choose the chapter. How about that? You just go wherever you want in there. Once you got to Obadiah, anywhere in Obadiah, go ahead and stick your finger in Obadiah and then go over to Genesis chapter 25. The book of Obadiah is a story of two mountains, a story of two people settled on two mountains. There's God's people, and then there's the people without God called Edom. Decided they didn't need God and went their own way and settled in their own mountains. Now, what I want to do is before we get into the book of Obadiah, I feel it be prudent to get into Genesis chapter 25 and look at the origin. Here's where both these people came from, and we can see some insight that God gives us in Genesis chapter 25 in verse 21, so we'll read down through there, then we'll go to the book of Obadiah. So Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 21, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord entreated of him, and then Rebekah, his wife, conceived, and the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. She she's, has twins, and they're actually like struggling within her, her womb there. And the Lord, in verse 23, said to her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people 
shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elders shall serve the younger. The Bible says, And when her days were delivered and were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother, and his, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. So we see a, a people here separated and struggling. Like obviously, Edom, what we see in Obadiah, is the people of, of Esau. So with that being said, we want to go forward, fast forward in future into Obadiah now. This is the time, I believe, that when... Uh, uh, this is when Judah is being carried off by Babylon... And here's Edom, the brother, who just watches it happen and actually participates in the spoils. And God has something to say about that. So if you're at Obadiah, would you stand with me for the respect of the reading of God's word, if you're able to? And we will read just the first four verses of Obadiah. The Bible says, A vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Our Father in heaven, Lord, help us make some application of the scriptures here today. Lord, I pray that you'd eliminate distractions from this room and from our minds that we may focus on your word. Lord, I pray today that the gospel will be going forth to each and every mind and heart. That, Lord, even today, maybe online or in-house here, that you would save a soul. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for the privilege to speak your word. Hide me behind the cross today that you may be seen. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you. Would you be seated? God hates pride. I mean, really, you read the Word of God, you see it. God absolutely hates pride. And pride is really the root of most of our problems, most of our sins. I mean, we have kind of the, the, the problem level of our problems, like where it's causing us issues. We have the root of that problem. And, and then you, you get down there, you find out pride. So many oftentimes is our, our issue. What is pride? Pride is, if I can just kind of strip it back and oversimplify it for today, is pride is when we take our opinions, we take our feelings, and we elevate them above the things of God. And so understand that once we do that, we're on very slippery ground. I know the Bible says this, but I feel this. You understand? Because once we get to that place, we then eliminate the need of God. And the ultimate goal of pride is for us to believe that we can live apart from God. That's Edom. They had their mountain apart from God. Of course, God's people settled in Mount Zion. These people are Mount Edom. And we see a story of these two mountains coming together. Proverbs 16, 18. You all know this one. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. What goes up must come down. We understand that, and we can see that through all of history, right? Satan, what was his, what was his big deal, right? I will put my throne above the stars of God. And then what happened to him and all the angels that followed him? <whistles> Adam and Eve, you know, of course, devil talking to Eve. Hey, Eve, if you, if you disobey God, you could be as a God. Eve's like, all right, woo. Boom, right? And we know this all throughout history, right? Titanic, the ship that was unsinkable, right? Yeah, we've seen it so often. Pride is so deceptive. Pride is almost impossible for us to see in ourselves but very easy for us to see in everybody else. Pride is a really interesting thing. Pride is kind of like, it, it, it's so dangerous because in it itself, it hides itself. 
It's almost like that brain tumor that's killing you, but it's inoperable because of where it's at. It kind of just, it just blinds ourselves from understanding the pride in our own life. It's almost impossible to see. And this is something we all struggle with. I began studying this weeks ago, and I remember thinking like, yeah, just like everybody else, I struggle with pride in this area, this area, and a lot of times pop up kind of sin problems here. And the more I study this passage of Scripture, God kept illuminating all these parts of my life. It's crazy. And we all have these different areas of pride, how we lift ourselves up. We all have these different things. And a lot of times what we do is we lift people up based on like what we're really good at, or we lift ourselves up above others based on what we're really good at. So a lot of times, like, you know, let me explain this, because most of us, we kind of think we're better than, than most people. We kind of know we're not the best, but we know we're better than most people. They, they've done studies a lot. Driving, they, you know, every driver, are you worse than most people, as good as most people, or are you better than most drivers? You know what we'll always put down? We're better than most drivers. That is statistically impossible. We can't be all better. But it's just our human nature. We want to be up above people. We want to be better. So what our mind does, it gives us ideas that we are good at so we can be better than other people. I make more money. Whew. What are you guys worried about? I've done this before. I am really good at business. I go to the gym a lot. I can do this many sit-ups. I can do pull-ups. It's usually what we're good at. Brother Ron, I'm taller than everybody else. <laughs> Brother Don, I have three pins in my pocket. You might only have one. I'm from the South. Where's Josh at? <laughs> Don't we just, we come up with these ideas. We come up with these, are you okay now, Mary? We come up with these things in our head and we put ourselves up. But you know the funny thing is, I'm never more vulnerable is when I lift myself up. This pew right here, it was really, they're not going to forget this sermon, you know? <laughs> Remember that time the pastor almost fell on us? Yeah, we understand that. We lift up our education. Well, I have a PhD. Well, I serve more in the church. I've given more. I've been a member longer than you. I did this. I did that. And we have our brains, this pride in our brains comes up with these scenarios, and we rank people, but we always rank ourselves just about at the top where most people are below us when we go, I'm a good person, I'm a good church member, I'm a good this, and we continue to want to put ourselves and lift ourselves up as high as we possibly can. Edom here, God calls out their pride. He says, your pride has deceived you in verse 3. You have a very deceptive pride. You think these things. Pride has brainwashed you. You think these things, but really, you're in trouble. Because God goes, I'm coming after you. You're up there going, who can bring me down? Number one, if you're taking notes, I would say the pride has deceived them into thinking they have security. They have security. Who shall bring me down to the ground? Now, Edom is really interesting. It's south, okay, south of Israel, south of, of Judah, in modern-day Jordan. Uh, if you read the scriptures right here, their capital was Taman. Taman today is Petra. You ever seen Petra? Petra is, if you ever watch Indiana Jones, and I believe it's the last uh, temple of doom. That's the shot they use for that. If you've ever seen it, it's a big desert area carved into a canyon. It's this beautiful motif of a building and everything. It's awesome because it's up high. There's hilly areas. You can get into caves. The geography of this, ge geography of this place actually says this. It says that uh, they were told 12 men can hold off an entire army. That's how secure this place was. You see why they're saying, who? can bring us down. If 12 men can defend against a whole army, we're safe. You say, well, okay, well, what about other stuff? Like, you can't just hold up, right? Yeah, but get this. The, right past Petra right there is called the King's Highway. The King's Highway went from Egypt and went all the way up through the Middle East into Jordan, that area. It was a trade highway. It was a big deal. And guess what? Somebody goes down your little highway through your town. Guess what you get to do? Collect some money. I mean, they got stopped somewhere. They got to eat somewhere. And frankly, you can just tax them. You can just go ahead and do it. So think about this for a moment, my friends. Mount Edom right here, these people, they are so secure in their little secure spots, way up high, where they can defend it easily, and they have more money than they know what to do with. They got it. 
They said, who can bring us down? They're watching Israel be looted. They're watching Judah be looted. And they're like, oh man, that's really too bad for you guys. No one can touch us. And by the way, these are not bad things. But do we trust in these things? You may say, oh man, I have a very lucrative business. I have a good job. I've been able to collect or whatever it is. I'm not preaching against having things. I'm not preaching about having a nice house in a gated community. I'm just saying, do you trust in those things? Oh, I'm safe now. No one can, you know what? Recession may come, not me. I'm set. Zombie apocalypse may come, I'm set. I'm ready for everything. Nothing can get me. And it shows our pride deceiving ourselves into security. Pride deceives us into believing that we are self sufficient and we are in control of our life. That's what pride does. Pride makes you think, I'm a self made man. Nobody can take me down. I can do this. I've heard people say, if I lost everything today, I could, I could, I could do it all over again because I'm just that talented and awesome, I guess. So if anything that happens, I am in control, I am self-efficient, and what that means is, God, I don't need you anymore. Do you realize, Christians, that's the worst thing you can say, is I don't need God. To live a life separate from God and we lose our dependence on God, that is a slippery mountain. You start climbing that mountain, you're going to fall. Here's the thing, you can't be God. Control is an illusion. I'm in control of my life. There's nothing that can happen that can take me down. I have figured out I'm playing 5D chess in my life. I have everything. I have the money, the security. I have the relationships. No, I'm telling you what, my friends, you start getting in that area of your life, and maybe some of you have walked down that path before. I'm going to just prepare for everything. I have my doomsday bunker. I have this. I have that. And you realize you're trying to control what you're trying to do to control. And control is nothing but illusion. You think you're in control until God says, yeah, watch this. You're not in control anymore. All of a sudden, life spins out of control, and you go, I planned for 10 different scenarios of life, and that was the 11th, right? The thing is, you're not God. But it's just what happens, though. You get very anxious about the future because you're in control. Your, your longevity, your life, your prosperity, everything is based on you. So now what you're going to do is you're going to worry about it nonstop. What if there's an 11th scenario I haven't thought of? I've saved up this much for retirement. What if I live to 120 what a terrible thing to outlive your, your retirement, you know, and worry about it. No sleep. Lay in bed at night. Think about all your thoughts and burdens keeping you up because you're trying to be God. You're trying to take control. You're trying to say, yeah, I've my high place. Yeah, nobody can bring me down. I have the respect of men. I have the bank account. I have the gated. I have everything. I have everything. I have everything. It's funny because in Luke 12, Jesus tells us a story about a really rich man, right? Apparently he planted some fields in some very rich land, God blessed it, really grew up really good. And this guy says this. He says, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones and I'm going to fill them with all the stuff I'll ever need for the rest of my life. And when I've done that, he says, I'm going to take ease and relax. And you know, the funny thing about that is I've never heard that preached in a positive way. And yet that's the American dream, isn't it? Listen, make enough money so you don't have to work. That's it, right? Just, just go ahead and you know, become, a, become a, a TikTok millionaire, Instagram person or whatever. I'm old, I'm sorry. <laughs> just find a way to get a lot and just take ease. And again, you have a lot. Praise God for you. I'm so glad you're here at Oxford Lake Baptist Church. We'll take up offering in a little bit. <laughs> Nothing wrong. God blesses people. Certain people he can trust or they can be a blessing to other people. But when you set your security into those things, then you're on slippery, slippery ground. Because he says, I'm going to take my ease and relax. And what does God say? He says, thou fool. He says, today, tonight, your soul is going to be required of thee. We don't know the future. So we try to prepare for everything we possibly can. And Obadiah answers this. Who can bring us down? We are so safe. We are so secure. And they're deceived. And God says the scariest thing. He says in the end of verse 4, I'll bring you down. You know, I was thinking this morning, I wrote down 1 Timothy 6, chapter, chapter 6, verse 17. The Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, so if you're doing well financially, you don't get to look down at your nose at anybody who's fallen on hard times, right? You don't get to do that. Oh, well, 
I guess you didn't make good. You didn't invest in Google back in the 90s or whatever. Man, that would have been a good investment, wouldn't it? If they were allowed in the 90s. Microsoft, I don't know. He says, don't let them trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That our God, we got to trust in him for everything. Because remember, the ultimate end of pride is I can be self-sufficient away from God. And when we realize that we are dependent upon God for every breath in our lungs, Amen. man, when we separate ourselves from God, we are on dangerous, slippery ground. So here's the thing. Okay, pastor, you just said I can't trust in riches. I can't trust in security. So therefore, what do we do? You got to find a mountain more solid. You got to anchor yourself to something more solid than yourself, okay? What is that? I can give you two things. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He's not going to give up. He's not going to change. He's not going to fall. He's not going to be defeated. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the solid rock. Secondly, obedience to his word. God says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but not his word. It'll abide forever. Amen. My friends, I'm encouraging to you today, if you said, you know, I don't really need God. I don't need a relationship with him. I don't need the Christ. I don't need the church. I don't need all these things. You're being deceived from your pride to thinking you are secure. Until the rug gets pulled out on you, it's a slippery mountain. Today, 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 place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for now and for tomorrow knowing he's going to take care of you. Secondly, if you're taking notes, I notice there's a deceptive superiority. The deceptive superiority, look at verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle. Man, the eagle. I, I actually checked this out. I, I actually looked this up. I, I thought, you know, eagles. We put some bird feeders in our backyard, and now um, we, then, we, then we printed off all the backyard birds of Michigan, and we've been crossing them off as we've been seeing them. We're bird watchers now. It's weird, you know? Uh, I guess that it was this. I haven't seen the eagles, though. Eagles don't like bird seed, apparently. No, eagles are not happy down low, are they? Eagles will fly by about 15,000 feet. They're up there. I actually skydived one time at 15,000 feet. You can't really even see the ground that much from there. It's terrifying. That's where they like to be, way above everybody else. And you know what happens when we start thinking that we're better than everybody else? We, we turn into these colossal jerks, don't we? Edom has turned, or pride has turned Edom into the biggest jerks in the Bible. I mean, I want to show you something in a minute here, but I just I want to say Edom's the kind of people that like, you know, when you hold the door open for somebody and you're hurrying to go to McDonald's and they cut right in line right ahead of you and then act like they have to read the menu. If you go to McDonald's and have to read the menu, you, come on now, this is America. We have the menu memorized. We know it. These are the kind of people, you have a group assignment at school. They do none of the work and take all the credit. Wow, why did you guys look at Larry when that happened? Oh, wow. Yikes, okay. These are the kind of people that in a public place, a doctor's office, they're talking on their speakerphone very loudly. Okay, some people are like, oh, that's me. Ooh. Okay, I'm just being facetious there, but there's a time if you'd like to turn your Bibles in Numbers chapter 20. Let me show you how superior they are in their own minds in Numbers chapter 20. This is the time in Numbers chapter 20, Moses is leading the Exodus. They spent their 40 years in the wilderness. It's time to go into the promised land. And so they're coming up around that area on the King's Highway. King's Highway cuts through Edom. And so Moses sends people, representatives to go talk to the King of Edom and say, hey, the quickest point is from here to here is right through your land. We're going to come through. Is that okay? We're not going to bother nothing. We're not going to touch anything. We just want passage. Your brother wants safe passage after being slaves in, in, in for, uh, for Egypt for 400 years. Seems like it would be a no-brainer, right? Numbers chapter 20, look at verse 14. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith the brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that befallen us. How our fathers went down to Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through the country. We will not pass through the fields, or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. 
You know, stop right there for a moment. Think about this. Did they not hear what happened to Egypt when they wouldn't let them go? These people have no fear of God in their thoughts. Verse 19, and children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink the water, and I will pay for it, I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. He says, okay, if accidentally uh, one of my cattle drinks something, I'll pay for the water, I'll take care of it. And he said, thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through the border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. Wow. Can you imagine that? The superiority that they think they have now over finally over Israel. Man, we have the right to let you through, but we're not going to. Why? Because we're jerks, that's why. See, pride lets us think we're superior to others. And when we believe we're superior to others, we are led to treat them badly. The people we think we're better than, we tend to treat them badly. And you know what? We read the word of God. God does not allow us to look down on people. We've talked about this before, and I, frankly, we had a really great message. I don't remember if it was Tuesday night, I think, preached during our revival that was talking about the same thing. You know what we need at Oxford Lake Baptist Church? You know what White Lake needs? We need to go through and take the least of the least of the least of the people, bring them in our doors, and love them and show them Christ. Amen. We need the smelly drunks. We need the ones that are addicted to drugs and have no idea what they're going to do. The ones that don't have a penny in their name. The ones that have a long rap sheet. The ones that are just down on life. We need to bring them here. But I'm telling you what, my friends, they get here, you better not look down on them. You better start serving them. That's what the Bible says. I tell you this, you don't have to turn here, but if you don't believe me, it is in the Word of God. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 7. We're in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. God says, Thou shalt not abhor the Edomite. He says, don't regard with disgust or hatred the Edomite. Uh, God, do you mean those same jerks that wouldn't even let us walk through the land? So we had to walk way around? Yeah, those guys. I can't be mean to them. I can't even hate them. No. He says, for he is thy brother. Yikes. You know, the verse doesn't even end right there. The verse continues on. It says, thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian. Oh, you mean the people that made us slaves for 400 years? Yeah, those people. He says, because thou were a stranger in your land. God does not allow us to look down and hate on our enemies. We don't get to look down our noses at anybody. We don't get to. He doesn't give us that because if we start doing that, okay, well, we have the knowledge of the word of God. You know, we were talking in the car on the way here today. Me and my boys were talking. I can't remember what it was. And uh, he, they're kind of asking why things are the way they are. And I'm like, well, it's because our nation votes for idiots and puts them in office, you know? And the Lord goes, you know, you're going to preach against that today. I said, oh yeah, you're right. But sometimes you just want to, sometimes you, I know more than you. I have the Lord Jesus Christ in my corner, and you obviously are a lost person, and I am so much better than you. You know what the Bible says? It says to love our enemies. You know what love is? I can't look at my enemy and go, that's what the world thinks love is. Love is a purposeful commitment to serve. I got to serve my enemies. That's what the Bible says. I cannot look down on my enemy while I'm serving them. Bible says in church, if any of you is great, who is the greatest among you, let them be the servant of all. That's what the Bible says. Boy, when we start thinking we are better than other people because, well, I can do more pull-ups than Brother Josh. I can, I can, you know, I, I wish, for Josh, I went to four years of seminary, you know, I'm like, oh man, he did. Well, I got a better car than you. I have more experience than you. I got a better business than you. I have more. Boy, so we just start looking down at other people based on some weird ranking that we just put in our own heads. I'm prettier than you. I've never said that, but maybe you have. I don't know why the Lord put that in my mind. Pride deceives us into thinking that our feelings and emotions are above God's authority. You hear that? When we're superior, our feelings and emotions. Turn to Romans chapter 1 with me. I know I got a lot of scripture today. But we're going to, this is the introductory message into deceptiveness of pride through Obadiah here. But in Romans chapter 1, how do we get here? Where are we at? Well, here's the thing. It shows us right here in Scripture that when we start to believe that we are above God, what happens? 
when we believe that we are not just above people, but our, our feelings, our emotions are above God's authority. Romans chapter 1 tells us this. Romans chapter 1 is scary. Scary in a couple ways. Number one, it really describes our culture today really well. And what it's talking about is a people who refuse to acknowledge the authority of God. What happens when we see that there has to be a creator to creation? There has to be. Our hearts reach out. There has to be a God. There has to be something better, bigger than us. There has to be. But then we just say, you know what? No. I'm the top of the food chain. I'm the greatest. The end of life is me. Paul says, here's what life is going to look like for you. This is, this is really what it's, it's going to be like. And, and so I want to pick up, it's a long passage of scripture, but just in verse 21, he says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This is pride. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made of corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Can you imagine? God is here. Creation is here. And they said, no, we're here, and we're making God here. This is what happens. Wherefore God also, this is a scary phrase, gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves. If we go through this past scripture, look how many times God says he gave them up, gave them up, gave them up. What does that mean? That means, you know, you and I as a child of God, when we are disobeying God, we're slipping away, we're backsliding, God's going to put some things, he's going to chastise us, he's going to stop us, he's going to try to work as hard as he can to get our attention, get us back. But these people who have eliminated God from their mind, thinking, and life, God's going to let them go wherever their flesh and pride takes them. Whoa. That is terrifying. What verse are we at? Uh, <clears throat> verse 25, who changed the truth of God to a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is a blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections for their women did change the natural use uh, unto that which is against nature. And likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemingly and receiving in, re in themselves the recompense of their heir, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate, an unapproved, a rejected mind to those whose things are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, uh, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do they do the same, but have pleasure in them that do the same. I know there's a lot in that passage of Scripture. I'll make a couple comments before we move on. But we look at a lot of what happens when we say, I'm above God. What happens when a nation, a people, a person is said, God is here, I'm here, I'm above God. He says, God's going to let you go. He's going to let you go down that slide and see how far your sin, depravity is going to take you down. And he says, it's pretty bad right here. And we're seeing this in our culture today. He calls out sexual immorality. Can I just say this? I'll just say this really quickly. It'll be a good blanket statement over a lot of things, okay? I got teenagers and your teenagers are my youngest ones in here, right? Okay. Teenagers. Okay. You guys know sex is a real thing, right? You guys heard about that yet? Okay. Plug your ears if you haven't heard that yet. Okay. <clears throat> God's, the only sexual satisfaction that humans will ever have is inside the institution of marriage. That's it. I know there's immorality going everywhere. There's fornication, pornography. There's all, I mean, people have figured out all these things. But you know what they do? They do it over and over and over. It's like they can't stop every night, a new thing. They get deeper and deeper. They dive deeper and deeper into these, they call them, whatever they call them, okay? They just go deeper into these wick, sick, twisted things because they can't, it's like a druggie trying to get their hit. And I'm telling you, the only way, the only way it works is the way God said it was the institution of marriage. That's it. Because we have to recognize God created marriage. We are not, the Supreme Court back in 2015 voted to re, um, re, re uh, give me a word, Ron, what is that word? Re, no, bad word. Redefine marriage, thank you, Joan. Redefine marriage. Here's the thing, they don't have the authority to redefine marriage. It's God, he made marriage. Who do they think they are redefining God's institution? It's a mess now. 
I'm talking every aspect of it. It's crazy. People are like, listen, preacher, be quiet. It doesn't affect you. The height of pride for me not to care about something because it doesn't affect me? Hey, Calvin, your son's playing out in the middle of the road right now. I don't care because it doesn't affect me. When did we stop caring for other people? When did we stop caring about our nation? Hey, how about the next generation? Does anyone want to be 10 years old right now and have to live the rest of their life the way the nation's going? It's okay, we'll be gone. The, the heights of the pride we have. We have this day where we just say this, I deserve to be happy. Says who? The heights of pride, I deserve to be. Sometimes what makes you happy is pretty bad and hurts other people. Now, we spent Sunday nights a while back looking at happiness. God is a good father. He wants you to be happy, but happiness comes from serving obedience and holiness. My friends, you are not here to have a good time. You're here to leave a good legacy. I do not want my children happy if they have disobeyed and gone against God. If my children say, hogwash, I'm going to live a wicked life out there just like the prodigal son, I want them miserable. I don't want a second of relief in their life until they get back to God. I want holy children, and then I want happy children in that order. We value being the individual more than who we are in Christ. We live in this, look at me. I mean, we do the weirdest thing to our, 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 our looks, our way we dress. We do these weird modifications because we want everybody to look at me. We are the time of me and social media, me. We're self-serving. What do I get out of this? That's our question before we do anything. We're frustrated with people. Why do we get frustrated with people? That happens to me. I'll tell you what, my pet peeve right now, driving down the road and a slow person in the car in front of me. Go! You know, I'm, I'm coaching them through the windshield. Hit the big skinny pedal. Move. Because, listen, if I strip that back, here's the thing. Because I am more important than you, and what I'm doing is more important than what you're doing. Get out of my way. And it gets to God, please humble me. I don't put a Christian bumper sticker in the back of my car. I do not want to be a bad testimony. Those of you that do it, God bless you, drive good. Don't get pulled over. We're frustrated. We complain. We're complainers because things should be for me. We have these eagles that fly at 15,000. We have eagles in church too. You know that, right? That's our problems where we say, you know, when most people get mad, they don't come and say, you know, I don't think God was honored by that. Basically it is, that hurt my feelings or I didn't get my way. Why didn't I get recognized? You forgot my thing. And God forbid we elevate ourselves above God in the church where we care more about what people think than we do what God would have us to do in our life. When God's speaking to our hearts and God says, you know, it would be a blessing if you stepped out. Maybe a blessing if you prayed at the altar. Maybe a blessing to somebody else and you say, no, I'd rather not. I don't want people to think I'm dealing with something. Well, I don't want people, I don't want, I don't want to encourage the pastor. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, you know, people might think I'm struggling with something. People might think I'm, listen, we all know we're all dealing with pride. If any of you aren't, let me sit down and you can preach this message. I thought I was pretty humble and proud of it until I started studying this as a joke. <laughs> pride stops growth. And so Obadiah answers this deception with truth. We go back to our text and we look at verse 2. He says, behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Hold on. Wait a second here. We're eagles soaring at 15,000 feet. We are so much better than everybody else. And God says, you morons, you're so little. You're so weak. You're so despised. Boy, we get a good view of ourselves from God's level, don't we? He says, basically, you're weak and everybody hates you. <laughs> And by the way, it was really interesting, too, because they're, they're cheering on Babylon, right? Yeah, get them. Woohoo! Yeah. Oh, any spoils left for us? Yeah, we'll take them. Yeah, awesome. We don't like Israel. Take them down. Boom. You know what happens not so many years later? Verse 7. Verse 7, Obed, I know we didn't read this, but it says, All the men of the Confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee. Pride deceives and prevailed against thee, that they may eat the bread. Uh, thy bread hath laid a wound under. There is none understanding him. The same people they partnered with came back and took them out in the 5th century B.C. That's exactly what happened. This is what pride does. Pride puts us up. I'm so much higher. I'm so much better. And I'm going to tell you what, it's a slippery place to be. Which mountain are you on today? 
I got to hurry up and quit. Man, we have ran out of time. Last one, deceptive serenity. Deceptive serenity. Pride lets us think that we are immune to consequences. Pride makes us think that we, we lead down a path to destruction and separation from God. That's the biggest lie we can have is I can live apart from God. I can live my life peacefully apart from God. It doesn't work that way. Name one institution that's better off without God in our day. Let's talk about the schools. How are the schools doing? We used, to, we used to have, the Bibles used to be a textbook in the schools. You know that? They used to be. We used to not have Satan clubs. We not, used to not teach our kids sinful perversions of God's gift of sex. We used to not do those things. Now we teach them that they're monkeys and their tails fell off and, and all these things. Hey, how's that working out for us? How, how about the government? How's the government doing without God? No, no, pastor, separation of church and state, not in the Constitution, and also not written to keep us out of the state. It's to keep the state out of our business. So next time there's a pandemic and Governor Whitmer goes, you should shut down Knox Blake Baptist Church, we can say, separation of church and state, get out of here, which we kind of did. <laughs> <clears throat> How's government working out now? They're trying to... <sighs> hey, backslider, how about your family? How about your house? How's that working out? Where, where have you slipped away? And you kick God out of this area and this area and this area. How's that working out? When you kick God out of your marriage, how's that working out for you? Your own life. Maybe you stop doing your devotions. Maybe you stop doing some things in your backslide. How's that working out? Is it great? Is it wonderful? How's the mountain working out for you? You see, on the top of the list of things God hates is pride. These six things that the Lord hates, yea, seven are abomination. Number one, a proud look. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to God. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. You know what's the thing is this? You are not okay with God with pride in your heart. You are not okay with God. Don't go living through life like, you know, everything's great and everything's wonderful because I'm just good with God and all those things. Do you want to have God against you in life as your opponent? Do you want God to be continually against you? Some people feel that way sometimes, and maybe it is true because maybe they got to deal with that pride of saying, I don't need you anymore, Lord. I know better than your word, God. See, pride will make you think it's all good. They're up there. Oh, you know, Edom's like, hey, man, look at this. We have all the money we want. We're better than everybody else. Look at Israel getting judged. We're good. We're up in our mountains. Twelve guys defend the whole army. Nothing can happen to us. Everything's good. That's what pride will do. It'll make you think, you know what? I got this all figured out. And sometimes I believe, and maybe this is not in the Bible, or maybe you can find it somewhere for me here, but I believe sometimes the world, the flesh, and the devil will lull you into hell. All of a sudden, everything lines up, and you're like, no, my life is good. I don't even, my neighbors are Christians. They're always dealing with problems. Me? No, I've never been church in my life. I don't have a problem. And I think sometimes the whole thing kind of just kind of lull you to sleep a little bit, away from spiritual things. I've witnessed the people so many times, and they'll say, I've never accepted Christ as my Savior, but I'm on good terms with God. God's been with me my whole life. God's always been with me. I'm like, I don't know who's been with you, but I don't think it's God because the only way the Father is through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The world, the flesh, and the devil lull us. You know, the Babylonians went right into Petra. They went right into Taman. They went right in there. You see, when I have serenity in my life, and can I just be transparent with you for a little bit? Sometimes I'm not a great Christian because when my life is going really well, I don't really feel the need to read my Bible as much. You know when I read my Bible the most is when I'm desperate and scared and hurting. I'm the pastor. I kind of have to be in church a lot, okay? So I don't know what my attendance would be like if I wasn't the pastor. I'm pretty sure I'd still be in church as much as I can. But you know when things are going well in life? Hey, it's Sunday. Sunday is your day. Oh, the pride of taking the day away from the Lord. How about prayer? When things are going well, what's the need to, why pray? What's the point? You know, there's got a lot of people who are going to be devastated and they stand before God someday because they've just kind of put themselves on Mount Edom. They've been safe. They've been okay. Things have gone well in their life and they just cannot believe that all of a sudden they've missed out on the greatest blessing. It was actually to live dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people taste, say, oh, you Christians, Jesus is just your crutch. God is just your crutch. And I say, you are absolutely 100% completely wrong. He's more than my crutch. He piggyback rides me through life. I ride him, okay? He carries me through life, is what I'm trying to say. But I'll tell you what's better than the crutches of this world. Drugs, alcohol, pornography, adultery, 
all those things. Those are the crutches the world's using. What about us? I'm glad the Lord Jesus Christ carries me. What do we do with this? I'm at the end now. What do we do? We got two mountains. There's one that's an awareness of the reality of God and submission to him, understanding that we need him for all things. And then there's the mountain of self that goes, you know, I can do a better job myself. But here's the problem. Here's where it starts. Right, follow me, guys. This is what happens. God, I don't need you. I don't want to trouble you. You're, you're not, whatever. You're not my thing. I, I respect Christians, but they're just, it's not. Self. Well, if I start taking care of myself, then I lock into pride. Now I'm walking in pride, and Bible says pride leads to deception. And once I am now living my life deceived of the reality, my next step is destruction. That's the path that goes down. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Do not ask God to humble you. Don't ask God to humble you. Because if I go through the scriptures I see here, I don't see that asked in scripture at all. Dean, do you have 1 Peter 5, 6? Humble yourself. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Matthew 23, 12, from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. My friends, the way up is down. This is not brain science. This is the simplest thing right here. What do you mean, Pastor? What do I got to do today? Because I'm telling you, I studied this out. The Lord spoke to my heart. I realized this. Here you go. Here's you. Ready for this? Here's what I want you to ask you to do. Make yourself a servant. Make yourself a servant. What did Jesus do to the feet of the disciples? He washed feet of men. Like, men feet are gross. Feet are all gross. Men feet are really gross. Who have been walking through the sun. I mean, my son's, so I, you know, where's Brother Josh at? He was here somewhere. Why oh, are you sitting over there? Your teens are up here. <laughs> what? You like Jay better than your teens? Okay, never mind. I got cal you got calluses in your hands now? We have, we used to, Brother Josh used to have soft preacher hands. Now we have going to the gym man hands now, right? My kids looked at me the other day and go, oh, what's that in your hands? That's gross. I'm like, those are man calluses, boy. You'd be lucky if you get one someday. Can you imagine people walking? You know how mad the disciples feed of corns and bunions and hammer toes and all that stuff? It's gross. The God of the universe, born of a virgin, the creator of all things, humbled himself to get down and wash the feet of mere men. And doesn't he say this? He says, now I've showed you. This is what you do now. Humble yourselves. Find someone to serve. Find someone. Put yourself under them. Put their problems above your problems. Put their joys above your joys. You know what sometimes when somebody gets blessed and we get upset with them and we get jealous? That's just pride in our hearts. Because we're upset somebody else they're talking about what we think we deserved. Be excited for them. Serve them. Put yourself under others. Secondly, ask God to show your heart to you. Psalm 139 says, search me, O God. Ask, I said, God, is there pockets of pride in my life? Because this is something, I'm not, this is not a sniper rifle message. This is not the one person dealing with this sin somewhere else. This is something we all struggle with. This is it. So God, show me under, show me, show me where I'm struggling with this at. Put yourself under God. Don't start judging God's word. Well, I just don't believe that. There's enough of those people out there, and it's ruining Christianity. Obey God. If God has spoken to your heart, listen to me, obey him. That's how you show submission, obedience. Amen. Obedience is what? Obeying all the way, right away, and with a good attitude. That last one's the hard part sometimes, isn't it? I'll do it right away. I'll do it all the way, but you cannot make me do it in a good attitude. I'm going to grumble the whole time. What is God asking you to do today? Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'll ask just a couple questions. We'll have a hymn of invitation. I want to talk to the Christians here first. You know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Christian, are you scaling the wrong mountain today? Do you feel like you're slipping, you're falling, you're scared at wit's end because, well, you've decided to kind of go your own way? Yeah, you trust that Christ is your Savior. You know the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're scared. You know, there may be somebody here that's struggling with an addiction and they haven't gotten victory over it because if they got victory now, if God gave them victory, you'd take the credit for it. You ever humbled yourself and said, Lord, I need you to take care of this for me and to humble myself. 
If that is you, I'm going to encourage you. If the music is even playing, it, just come right up down the altar, the altar, the front steps. I wonder if there's anyone here that is one year has never left Mount Edom. Maybe they've lived for their, their life, their whole self, to self, for self, and the Holy Spirit told you today, if you died today without God, you'd spend eternity separated. I want to ask you, the altar is open. I want you to come repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Find what true power is, what true control in your life is. Lord Grace, you mind playing softly? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray for these who have come forward and are praying. Lord, I pray that we as a church would set down our pride, Lord. Maybe do something we've never done before. Maybe humble ourselves before you. Lord, if you're speaking to a heart and mind, let us not say no. Let us act upon it here today, right now. Lord, if you've never, or if there's someone here who's never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, I pray you'd make their seat real hard right now. They'd have to get up to the altar. They have to do something about it. Lord, I pray today that you'd help us to see ourselves as you see us, Lord. That our, our value in us is in Christ. Our value is because you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son. That, Lord, you paid the ultimate price for us. So, Lord, I pray today that we see our value there and not have to lift ourselves up, but, Lord, that we'd humble ourselves to you today. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand to your feet for him of invitation? We're sitting at the cross. Alas, Alas.